thank you all. I'm really glad to be here. Um, I'm currently, in addition to being a solo practitioner, I'm currently a doctoral student with the University of Nebraska in their JSD program in space law, as well as a graduate of the University of Mississippi's master's program in air and space law and the JD program. Uh, now, I got here from Houston to Auckland to here this morning, so if I seem a little bit over or under caffeinated, I'll simply have to beg your indulgence. So, I'm here to defend the legality of mining space resources under international law. So obviously, we, we all know why this is an issue now. We have multiple states, the United States and Luxembourg, that have passed laws saying that it is legal to mine in outer space. The US law says that you can transport, own, and sell space resources. The Luxembourg law says that the resources of outer space are susceptible to appropriation. Occasionally, you will see somebody concerned if the U.S. law doesn't specifically uh, mention mining. Um, I'm told that, that the word mining is lacking simply because they wanted to make sure that this stayed in front of the Congressional Committee responsible for space issues and didn't want to drag in uh, people whose expertise was mining to deal with a space-centered issue. But you can mentally insert mining when you look at the U.S. law. That is what is at uh, focus in the property rights there. Okay, so the default rule in international law is that states can do what they want. And so the question is, have states constrained themselves from letting their nationals appropriate property in space? Specifically under Outer Space Treaty Article 1 and 2. Article 1 of the Outer Space Treaty talks about cooperation in space, it talks about there being free access to all, er to all areas of cel all celestial bodies. Article 2 of the Outer Space Treaty says that there's not supposed to be national appropriation of space or celestial bodies. So where does that leave a commercial mining in outer space? Now, the commercial aspect of that is the less controversial aspect. There is a UN statement on cooperation in outer space, a General Assembly resolution, which says that states get to determine how they cooperate in space. So in other words, according to the UN interpretation, there's not some sort of mandatory space socialism that we have to practice to fulfill Article 1 of the Outer Space Treaty. And this also mentions intellectual property rights, so therefore, according to the UN consensus interpretation, you have a right to property, or you have a right to profit from space. And under the, the gold standard of treaty interpretation, the Vienna Commission on the Law of Treaties, this sort of subsequent agreement, subsequent state practice, is supposed to be taken into account when you interpret a treaty like the Outer Space Treaty. Now, of course, that's really not what's controversial. Most people don't have a problem with somebody making money off of a TV program that is beamed from a satellite. What is controversial is extractive resources uh, from space, because it's a physical, tangible object. So is that different? Now, there's a bad answer that's floating around. And if you've heard it, I ask you, if you like property rights, please stop using this as a, as a, as a response. One is that, it just doesn't apply to private entities. The Outer Space Treaty Article 1 and 2 don't mention private entities, so private entities are simply not covered by the Outer Space Treaty. Now that's not true. Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty actually puts a greater level of connection between private entities <coughs> and their national governments that generally exists in international law. Uh, to skip ahead, this isn't just my interpretation. We can actually see this referenced in the negotiation of the Outer Space Treaty that was supposed to cover both private and public action. Uh, and going back a bit, this is really different than what generally exists in international law. So if you look at, say, the Philippines versus China arbitration on the South China Sea, there were some activities of private Chinese ships that the, uh, that the panel said weren't necessarily imputable to China. So you had to show that the private actor, uh, that their activity was somehow a state activity. Whereas in outer space, we don't have that sort of distinction. Now, in fairness, it may be difficult to tell which activities belong to which state once you have a large group of people cooperating together. You could have nationals from one country on another uh, country's spacecraft, and it can be very unclear who's actually responsible. But in theory, a, some state is supposed to be responsible. So you have some people that think this is the U.S., was the rationale for the U.S. law, that the U.S. thought that there wasn't, that private actors weren't covered. But if you look at the U.S. law, it basically treats space like the high seas. And so you can see Hugo Grotius uh, stating, stating that what somebody with their own hooks and nets takes is their own despite the sea being, the, being free for all people. And then you can see this actually implemented in 
uh, arbitral tribunals and international court of justice cases. So here we have an arbitral tribunal talking about uh, future interests, future profits being taken into account. And then more recently we have an IC justice case uh, in which says that the freedom of the high seas includes the right to fish. So in these two cases for illustration, we have one case which says that the common status of the high seas doesn't preclude harvesting resources from it, but actually allows it. And then another case which says that if you wrongfully prevent somebody from harvesting on the high seas, even future hypothetical profits taken out of the high seas uh, can be taken into account. So it's an enforceable property interest. Now, negatively, we can see that this, that you have a default right to extract from a common area, because in Antarctica, many states agreed not to claim anything in Antarctica when the Antarctic Treaty froze uh, claims in Antarctica and said, if you have one, you can't expand it. If you don't have one, you can't make a new one. And so that meant that for some states, they weren't going to be asserting sovereignty in Antarctica. That was not enough to block them from asserting property rights in Antarctica. You had to get a separate environmental protocol banning mining. So from the positive example of the high seas and the negative example of Antarctica, we see that you don't you have a default right to extract resources from a common area. Now, we can see that opposition to this isn't consistent. So to pick Russia as a specific example, at the, U, at the UN Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, on a UN COPOS legal subcommittee meeting, they said the US wasn't being wasn't being consistent when or wasn't being consistent with international law when they unilaterally allowed for mining of space resources. Russia's law is in some respects more aggressive than the US law when it comes to protecting Russia's interests. Now, it doesn't say anything about space resources. That's the US and Luxembourg, and perhaps to be joined by some other countries. But Russia's law does actually assert a right to extraterritorial jurisdiction over other states, the US, over nationals of other states in the vicinity of Russian space objects. This is for safety purposes, all right? So it's not about resources, but it does show that Russia is willing to take unilateral action in defense of their own rights. And so there's an inconsistency between what we see them saying in 2016 in the legal subcommittee meeting and what we see in their actual law. And I'm sure that once Russia sees that it's in their advantage to mine in space, they're going to say, that's legal. Um, this isn't a coherent position when we look at what their law actually says. And I'm not attacking their law. I'm simply saying that the U.S. actually scrapped the Asteroids Act, an earlier version of the, uh, of, uh, of the law which has authorized mining in space, because there was a concern that it might regulate other states' nationals. And so Russia's law did what the U.S. was afraid to do and directly uh, says it has a right to regulate nationals of other states. Uh, okay, so under the Outer Space Treaty, mining in space is legal. Of course, in Australia, Australia is a party to the Moon Agreement, unless the jet lag has confused me. Uh, and the Moon Agreement does have some concerning things in it. You have Article 6, which talks about a right to remove scientific samples. So, you know, if I was an outside investor, I might be concerned that maybe that didn't include a right to extract commercial uh, quanti uh, quantity of resources. And then Article 11 mentions a international regime to be established. So it's clear that under the Moon Agreement, you can uh, commercially prospect resources once the international regime is established. The question is, is there a moratorium? And actually, it looks like maybe, no. We have, we have evidence from the negotiation history of the Moon Agreement where it was stated uh, I, that there wasn't consensus, or according to this particular version, that no one wanted a moratorium. I don't know if that's true or not, but that at least shows there was no consensus in favor of a moratorium at the time the Moon Agreement was negotiated. So if, you're an if you want to Australia to stay a part of the Moon Agreement, you can argue that it's legal to mine into the Moon Agreement before establishing an international regime. And I do think that being part of the Moon Agreement probably does scare off some investors, and I would not want my own country to be a part of it, but there is a legal argument you can make, and because there are so few other signatories, Australia's voice presumably carries a lot of weight as to how we're going to interpret the Moon Agreement. Okay, you do see a few scholars out on the fringes and maybe even some more mainstream people saying the Moon Agreement binds non-party states. That's crazy on its face. Um, I could give you a long comprehensive argument, but I don't have time for that. So I'll just refer you to what an Australian delegate said during the negotiation of the Outer Space Treaty. He said that the various UN resolutions that had taken place weren't sufficient to make the Outer Space Treaty as a whole binding international law without actually signing it. So if that was true with regard to the Outer Space Treaty, it's certainly true with regard to the Moon Agreement, which has uh, less support. 
Okay. The, so the takeaways from this is you can mine into the Outer Space Treaty. You can make a plausible legal argument. You can mine into the immune agreement even without the even without making a new regime. What problems are there with the Outer Space Treaty? There are some. One is liability and how that re relates to jurisdiction and control. You have the Outer Space Treaty talking about liability or responsibility in terms of national space activities. You have the Liability Convention saying the launching state is liable. It's not clear how we would reconcile, how we would apply those in a specific case. We do have more guidance than some people think because there is a UN General Assembly resolution on nuclear power sources in space which indicates that a state will be treated as a launching state if they are operating a space, if they're exercising jurisdiction and control over a space object. The principles on remote sensing say that an operator can be held liable. So these both appear to be nods to the fact that we have states buying and selling things that are in orbit. And so it looks like if you had a case involving a state being held liable for a space object that they bought after it had been launched, this is how an international tribunal might rule on it. But the treaties don't clearly resolve that, so it's an ongoing ambiguity because the treaties don't deal with changes in ownership after launch. And then finally, what if you have two activities really <coughs> close to one another? And, and Article 9 of the Outer Space Treaty says that you're supposed to consult if you believe that a, a state is, uh, is potentially going to be interfering with your activity or you think your activity is going to interfere with theirs. But uh, it's, it's not quite clear how you would, resolve, you would resolve that sort of dispute. There are some broader international precedent and common areas for having safety zones or keep out zones, such as on the high seas around experiments or error identification zones near a country. But again, if you have two fixed installations and they're not moving and you have a safety zone around each, it starts becoming less clear how that's distinct from territorial appropriation. So that's an ongoing ambiguity with the outer space team. That said, the takeaway from this talk is despite all those ambiguities, you're legally, uh, you are legally in very permissible and defensible territory to mine under the Outer Space Treaty and maybe even under the Moon Agreement. All right, that's, that's done. I don't know if we have time for questions or not. <laughs> were there any questions or? Oh, okay. Yeah, how widely accepted would your views be in the international community? Uh, it's, still it's still pretty controversial. I think you have scholars on both sides of this, and I probably, I think in this room, we have scholars on both sides of this. I think this is the more defensible position. I think just as you had Russia's delegate to cope was trying to put forward another view, I think ultimately it would break down if you tried to stress test it, because it's not even consistent with their own law. Other states haven't had to make that sort of commitment because they're not as involved in space as Russia is. But I think over time, the view I've outlined is the view that's going to win out. Because I think that's just where the logic is. Supplementary question. What about, you haven't mentioned anything about the benefits to all mankind. Is there much controversy about that in, the, I, I in, think, in, in terms of how the wealth is shared? I think that's actually less controversial than any of the other things I've said. Uh, is I think the UN statement on cooperation in space is really the place to look to see how that is answered. There was consensus that it doesn't mean you just have to you just have to sh have to share everything in a sort of socialistic manner. You can you can benefit people through free market mechanisms or some other mechanism. It's it's at the state's discretion, and I think that the fact that you can get a UN General Assembly resolution on it indicates that there's some sort of consensus on that issue. Uh, so I think that's a little bit less controversial. How large is the engaged nation in the country? We hear that the U.S. and also actually put out federal national laws, but are there other countries that are all waiting in place? How, how many countries? Yes, I, there are people in the room who are far more clued into that than I am, uh, who are probably involved in the process. The, the United Arab Emirates, I heard one of their people talk and say they're considering it. I've heard maybe Japan, maybe China, and I just really can't, I can't speak to that as well as some other people. As far as the number of scholars, there's a lot of scholars uh, in countries that don't have national legislation because there's, there's, uh, there's need for scholars in countries that don't necessarily have their own national space program and that don't have an incentive to pass the laws yet. Uh, if you fast forward a couple of decades and some kind of very few countries are making a lot of money off of this, how do you reckon other international 
by other nations will, do you think they'll put, be able to put any international pressure on the, the haves uh, from the have-nots? I think the, I'm sure some people will try, but I think the incentive structure will be to get in on it and start having your own, you know, trying to incentivize states to you know, be based out of your country. Like, you know, like I think Luxembourg has, and like you see, in, in a way, the Isle of Man, it's not an independent country, but you can kind of see some states trying to find their niche in, 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 in with regard to with regard to space, and I think that is you have the cost of access getting cheaper, then you can have a wider variety of countries being involved. So. so that brings uh, this session to a close. We have the coffee break, but let's just have another round of applause for all of our five speakers. It's been We need to come back at uh, two, three, two thirty-five. Three thirty-five. Three thirty-five. Sorry.